welcome back everyone i hope you're having a good day i'm chaos cook and today we're beginning a brand new episode of click chat an interview series where we talk with professional musicians around the world today we talked with mrs yi chun Xu, a cellist who has extensive experience with both solo playing as well as chamber playing in addition to being a music pedagogue and educator in this interview, we're going to be discussing practice techniques as well as solo and chamber musics. I hope you all enjoyed this video. And as always, don't forget to drop a like and subscribe. Thank you all so much. Sure. All right. So thank you so much for being here today with me. I really appreciate it. And so today I just wanted to ask you some things about, you know, practicing in general, as well as audition competition preparation tips for cellists and also musicians in general. So first thing I'd like to ask is when you when you practice the cello every day, what, what's the first thing you usually do? Like, do you have a favorite warm up routine? Um, I usually, of course, you know, we would tune and we put a rock on the rods and things like that. But I actually uh, usually I like to jump into our, our arpeggios. Mm. Uh, I often find arpeggios sets up our hand shape a lot a lot better in a way and uh you know it teaches us also across different strings things are that are adjacent to each other and the relationships um to each other so i usually do that um i sometimes do a few you know finger exercises and you know uh, noodly things to to get things warm up a little bit but uh that's pretty much the first thing i would do are pedros and of course you know I would do my scales and uh, double stops after that, for sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I just wanted to ask some more about scales. So, I mean, for me as a violinist, um, my teachers always ask me to practice scales. Um, so for cellists, I know like because the size difference and then plus like scales and arpeggios, like the difference in, you know, spacing and the fingerings and things like that. So do you prefer your students to practice arpeggios over scales if they could only like have time for one or vice versa do they have to pick one or can they get, maybe spend equal time on both i think it's equally important because scales you know music is made of scales and arpeggios yeah Simple as that, right so yeah. i think they 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 are they go hand in hand and i think um for me <sighs> For my routine, I like to do arpeggios, but I think for for students, scales and arpeggios for sure. And then you know, with scales, it teaches us the the intervallic relationship of things, and then you get a little closer sense of where things should be. And then sometimes it's just it's the fact of maybe just moving your finger just a little bit, whether the angle of the finger needs to be just a little bit different. So I think scales really teaches us to listen closely and then learn how to navigate the, the fingerboard, having a map of that. Right. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I It's hard to choose. I, I would ad, advocate for, for for doing both. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so when practicing scales and arpeggios, do you have like an efficient way to like practice them? Because for me, my teachers have always asked me to do like like two note slurs, four note slurs, six note, et cetera, et cetera, and then like different rhythms. So is it similar for the cello? Uh, yes. And uh, I, I always like to make sure I practice my sound in the scale. Mm -hmm. Practicing to practice feeling um, I've got my arm weight on the string. I've got, you know, I, the strings got my bow and then trusting and then from the from the um, frog to the tip because usually tip is harder so I would spend a little bit time extra time on that and uh, yes do all the you know slur two slur three slur four five six seven those are good and uh, rhythms yes and I oftentimes what I like to do or ask my students to do is um doesn't matter what repertoire you're playing, but the current repertoire say some some difficult passages. Say if it's tricky bowing, uh, sixteenth notes, uh, but you slur three one separate, or you slur you slur three three separate and then slur another three. You know those kind of cumulative kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, I would always ask my students to practice in scales, difficult bowings, difficult uh, rhythms, and uh, some tricky tricky sort of juggling things. Um, I would always ask them to do that. 
Mm-hmm. So I find that efficient because you, at the same time, you practice your scales and also at the same time, you practice that certain technique that you're struggling with in the repertoire. Right, yeah, yeah. And then, so I've always been interested because the, the size, sheer size difference between the cello and the violin. I mean, shifting on the violin is already pretty difficult. Um, and then shifting on the cello seems even more difficult because you have like more gaps and then you have a much longer fingerboard. So what what is what is a tip you have on like how to practice shifting? Um, I think I wanted to say repetition, but even before we get to the repetition part, you need to make sure physically you're set up well, right? I, I, I'm not sure, for violin, probably similar idea. You know, you're, everything initiates from your back, your shoulder blades, right? And then from there, let the big part of your body to lead the smaller part as a, you know, as an aftermath that if the bigger part would move, the small part will follow, right? Yeah. So that's usually, usually first thing I would explain. And then always move in circular motion or in round kind of shape, shape yeah. in terms of, you know, physicality wise. Um, and I think violin the same, you, you've got the neck and you've got the body. Sometimes you get stuck at the body when you shift up, right? Yeah, yeah. Same thing for the cello. The the body yeah. is bigger, and so we have to prepare much earlier to 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 get around uh-huh. that big. Yeah, so you have to like shift the elbow when you get to like the rib area, and like go over. Yeah, so up and over, you know, is the easiest way to explain it. But uh, there's so much that's involved with our back, and then how the fingers should be positioned, you know, and then coming out, go up and go coming back down. It's yeah. a bit different. But uh, once once it's set up well, then lots of repetitions, right? And then also bear in mind, shifting is not only about the finger that's 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 being being shifted in a way, uh, yeah. but also what the rest of the fingers will where, where would they be? Right, having a map of that, then then that takes the pressure off from the the finger that's working. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then for violin, when I shift, um, my teachers have advised me to like move the violin to aid me in my shifts. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. So like for the cello, it's obviously less vertical movement. But when you shift in the cello, is there like horizontal a horizontal aspect of shifting, like the movement or? Uh, not necessarily with moving cello, not so much. Okay. But I could imagine that your body getting involved a little bit. Uh-huh. Perhaps yeah. Maybe something something about that, the fact you when you move the shoulder, right, our body probably will also anticipate a little yeah. bit. Yeah. yeah, that for sure. Uh, maybe not physically moving the cello because then there's, I feel like there's no stable point and then also cello is kind of hard to, you know, it's yeah. big. You would want to keep it centered. Right, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So moving on from like left, more left-handed focus techniques. So for sound production and right hand, um, open strings are pretty much, you know, a quintessential sort of warm up or at least, you know, basic technique to master on the violin. And I, I've always been told to, you know, like do that at the start of all my practice sessions, just like get warmed up. Um, is it the same for cello? Um, I think, yes, one could advise to do that. I actually sometimes um, I just ask my students to do scales and then for oh. the sound also. But I do think when when we are either learning new technique in a bow or in, in the right side of our body, or when we are sort of trying to get, um, get some technique uh, bet- better, uh, open string is always a good way to start and I'll, I always like to ask my students to do it slowly, do the motion very 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 slowly so that the the fine muscles they, they can learn and remember right and yeah it's just like so essentially just centering your focus on like an aspect of the right right hand side and just try to get that good sound production yeah yeah for sure I think open strings are very good I think oftentimes I ask my students to um, especially for learning how to play a little closer to the bridge for better sound production mm. open string yes definitely and then if 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 they're practicing like bow changes or mm. some sort of elbow or finger movements yeah I, w- I would usually in lessons ask them to we we, we learn about it in, in mm. open string first before we jump into anything else yeah yeah 
yeah so so when you're playing the cello and on the string on actually on the strings right there there should be like some amount of downward push because of gravity so when you're actually playing like to counteract that gravity um do you utilize your arms or your like or even your hand or your fingers in any way to like produce a good sound um for counter counteract that uh, gravity you have the string mm -hmm. and the string is holding the bow for you yeah, yeah. so actually i for me um i think the arm weight should always just be on the string uh mm -hmm. there's not too much counter okay okay yeah balance of that and then and then with our bow hold too so the strings got your bow right strings mm -hmm. got in other words strings got your arm weight mm -hmm. and then with our bow hold also the four fingers that are on top of the stick mm -hmm. they give the grav gravity kind of vertical kind of weight right yeah. and then the thumb the thumb is counterbalancing it but the thumb it doesn't you know push up or anything but the only job the thumb does is to counterbalance it mm -hmm. because you you try to do more than that the muscle gets tight and then the whole hand is tight right yeah so I, it's it's yeah it's a very fine kind of feeling and balance to find but i think the general general sort of rule of thumb is trusting that your arm weight the gravity is enough mm -hmm. and the strength got you and then within your hand there are there are um counterbalances within the hand that's built already so that you don't have to do anything too extra using your muscles to, to yeah uh -huh. yeah so when you try to focus on sound production making a big nice rounded sound mm -hmm. um are there any specific body parts that you focus on or like just like even contact point between i don't know string and hair mm -hmm. yes so for me um actually i have to thank my 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 teacher Joe Krasnick for teaching me this. Um, I think about my sh my back, my shoulder blade, mm -hmm. and then I actually focus on the feeling of underneath my um, upper arm. So Under in other words, yeah, on not not above, but underneath my upper arm, so that that kind of feeling ensures that my my weight is on the string. And then, and then I focus on I focus on the feeling of of course you know we're we're doing a sort of uh, a speedy version of it but the the in terms of the bow hold of course you know you got to make sure things are at the right place yeah but given that things are at the right place I focus on um, how the index finger feels mm -hmm. in relationship between the bow stick and and the bow hair and the string. To make sure that I'm feeling that kind of presence, that kind of resistance, that kind of friction throughout my bow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, when we're comparing sound production or like right hand technique in general versus like more left hand focused stuff like intonation or like clarity of trills, etc., when it comes to an actual audition or competition, like mm -hmm. do you know which one judges usually? focus on more or even way more heavily i think that's very hard to say but you know after all what any judges are looking for perhaps is the things you have to say with your music right mm. how how one is moved by the music right the power of it i think that's foremost being judged mm then and then of course the technique is sort of a must a given but i wouldn't i wouldn't i wouldn't say one would weight more than the other because they're both very important and they kind of influence each other also yeah right yeah so sorry i don't i don't have a clear answer <laughs> yeah yeah so when it comes to actual like musicality um how do you recommend a student should like develop and cultivate their own sense of, you know, musical interpretation? I think it comes in so many aspects, it makes a musician sort of wholesome and well-rounded. I think there's the innate kind of musicality that one should listen to, right? Listen to how you want to sing a phrase and uh, the kind of colors, the kind of timings you have in your 
in your ears and in your mind. But also, um, I think um, musicianship is also very important. You know, you, right. the study of music history, the study of music, music theory and ear training, they're so, so important because they inform us um, how things are built and how things are structured and how things, um, you know, are related to each other. And I think that will inform us um, how we play a lot of things. And then that contributes to our 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 musicality. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think also uh, with time, we feel differently about, say, a phrase, right? Yeah. Or a certain way to approach things. So I think also with time. Yeah, yeah. definitely. But that being said, one has to be um, sufficient with their technique in order to be able to um, express how they feel about the music. Mm, so, yeah. so that's the foundation of it. So, so outside of simply just practicing like physically and just playing on the instrument, like how else, what other strategies do you suggest when we're preparing for a competition? Um, record yourself, listen to yourself, study the score maybe make a roadmap of the of the pieces and and uh, you know and then study the score in a way find different materials and how they evolve throughout the piece and also um i what i like to do is uh, play the piece in my head every mm -hmm. single note including the sensation of it the sound the sensation the kind of uh, uh, visualize you know you know, with a violin, you will see certain part of the violin, the fingerboard, the angle of it. Um, that I like to do, and then I think it also helps. And especially with memorization, if you can play every single note in your in your mind, um, usually you're you are okay. Right. Yeah. And since a lot of the more prestigious, higher national or even international level competitions require a lot more repertoire, and oftentimes students. Who, especially those who are attending like an academic school don't have time to like go over all of those things at once how do you suggest you know like we rotate through our repertoire or pieces um i usually you know when there's not enough time i at least make sure you know you rotate everything within two or three days and mm -hmm. then also if you really don't have time to practice then usually we know where the weak spots are yeah right i start with those and then i think also playthroughs are so important play as if you're performing just performing through things and because then you will learn so much about yourself and the tendencies and where are the holes and then the next day you can come back to it to to sort of target these places and um yeah that's what i would say um of course as much time possible but when you don't have time just be be efficient, be smart about how to go about it, but do rotate things, you know, at least if not every day, maybe two, three days. Mm, yeah, definitely. So when it comes to like old repertoire that we've already played, like how often do you suggest that we review those? Like in case we need them for like a future audition or preparation for something else? So are you, these old repertoires, are you using them for competitions or you're sort of saying that, okay, I finished learning this piece. Should I still be playing it? Even if right now, currently, I'm maybe for, for uh, in the next half year, uh, I may not use it for audition. Yeah, like maybe the second case, like if we don't have like oh. one coming up. Oh, then I would just leave it be, leave it uh -huh. there right learn your repertoire and then work on the ones you need to work on so that you don't hold on to a piece for so long that uh then you don't have time to learn other repertoire which comes with different challenges i'm sure yeah that being said do be smart about it when you learn new mm -hmm. things. don't yeah. just finger work and then sort of just play the notes but you know uh, always think think a few steps deeper and further yeah yeah, yeah. and so moving on from solo repertoire so and so i know you play a lot of chamber music and so how do you think playing chamber music impacts a young musician's experience with music like i think a first of all the kind of 
uh, friendship that flourishes in in the chamber music setting is so precious, and it's yeah. you know oftentimes lifelong. I think that that is just priceless, and yeah. also I think it gives us give us a different perspective of music. And it's, it's, so we're not yes we're playing a single line, but at the same time, what role are we playing in relationship to others? I think it teaches us to listen differently and then to blend, to play different roles. And even if we're playing so single repeated eighth notes, uh, the way we play it, it should be, you know, in the best form of support to 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 everything else that's going on. I right. think it really helps us with our musicianship. And then it's, I think it's most satisfying when a group can play together and move together, both, you know, in terms of the actual ensemble playing, but also emotionally. Right. Is most satisfying. I think it just um in general, it helps us to become better musicians. Yeah, right. Yeah. And because such a depth of collaboration is sort of like required for like um like a successful collaborative chamber performance. Um when do you think like a beginner with music can start chamber like learning effectively? Effectively. Um, I think when they can get around the instrument uh, pretty sufficiently in a way, you know, intonation is more or less sort of um, uh, learned or uh, in quick in terms of adjusting. Yeah. And then, you know, string crossing shifts, all these things are m more or less mastered, then I think they will be they will be okay with chamber music. But even that being said, even if say they are on Suzuki books still, mm -hmm. one can still play together, you know, with each other, with their colleagues, with with a piano. Those are all great experiences, you know, so that we understand in relationship to others what our part means. Right. Yeah. 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 So so when playing chamber, what what's the most important thing? What's the most important thing? Oh. Yeah. That's hard to that's hard to uh, pick, you know. Um, <laughs> the awareness of other parts, the awareness of your role, the awareness of uh, your role in the overall structure, mm -hmm. uh, the 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 sensitivity to blend, also the sensitivity to intonation, and then also being on the same page, um, uh, emotionally. Right. Um, about where you are in a piece. And um, those are the things that on top of my head that came yeah. up. Yeah. So when playing, so chamber versus solo, like we can definitely apply like things we learn from chamber, like musical interpretation and et cetera to, to our solo work. Um, but what do you think are like the specific benefits of chamber versus solo are? Like, let's say like there's something that Chamber does really well that solo doesn't do quite as well or doesn't teach a player quite as well. Like what are the specific benefits of chamber in that? I think so much of the solo playing that we are under a spotlight. So oftentimes um, there's a certain way to approach a phrase, right? For the maximum of some production and also the brilliance. Uh, but in chamber music, you have to play many, many, many roles. Uh, wear many hats at the same time. So I think that really trains us to be sensitive and versatile in many ways. And then I think that sort of helps us to become a better soloist too. Mm -hmm. yeah, to to even just within a phrase, there are so much nuances to it and there's so much uh, ins and outs and, and uh, different kinds of uh, ways of playing it and possibly different roles too. I think one becomes much more sensitive and uh, creative in a way too. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So do you do you prefer one chant over the other? Like, do you prefer to play chamber or solo? Or... No, I don't have. Okay. I like both. Yeah, I like both. Yeah, yeah. And what do you think is the best composer for, let's say, like an intermediate level musician when you're playing chamber? It's good to start with some Haydn. Haydn, mm -hmm. right. yeah. yeah, that's what I thought. And then um, there are, I think there are some uh, trio sonatas. Mm -hmm. Also, they're, they're they're good. Yeah. Yeah. 
So what's your, what's your personal favorite cello repertoire? It could be chamber or solo, just in general. I like anything Schubert. Schubert? Mm, yeah. That's a, exactly. a lovely composer, yeah. Yeah, I love him. But, you know, I like all the things I play. It's, um, I can't say one better than the other. I yeah. Don't know more. Yeah. yeah the different challenges and different uh, scopes. Mm, right, is. yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking your time today. I really appreciated it. Yeah, great questions, Gail. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And uh, thanks for having me and I had a good time talking to you. No thank problem. you all so much for watching our video. I hope you guys learned something new about practicing solo or chamber or the more nuanced aspects about those topics as we usually do solo oriented interviews. So I hope this was a refreshing change. If you guys want to learn more about Mrs. Xu and her concert or educational availabilities, you can check out her website at yichunchu.com. As always, thank you all so much for tuning in and make sure to check back in on our channel for new music content. With that, see you all next time and have a great day. Thank you.